Sure, that's fine. So I've gathered together some of the principal points that I've uh, found pertinent from two chapters of Essays on the Gita, the Yoga of the Intelligent Will, chapter 10, and chapter 11, Works and Sacrifice. So these are just some of the primary points that I uh, found really sticking with me. And there are many subtle aspects of this discussion that um, I will not be covering, but it's best to find from Sri Aurobindo's own words. So altogether, he uh, explains that Arjuna shrinking from the task before him is based on an inaccurate and incorrect perspective, and that Krishna essentially proceeds to teach Arjuna how this is inaccurate and to coach him into a truer view. Krishna then proceeds to explain how Arjuna needs to develop an understanding based more fully in a true understanding of reality. Essentially, he says he's seeing it all wrong. Um, and Arjuna thinks that desire for the result of action is the motive for doing it. And Krishna leads him into a deeper understanding that this is not the case, that our motivation should not be desire for the result of action. That should not be our motive for doing it, but that action is for this, that action is not for this purpose, for accomplishing a desired end. So Krishna explains that this perspective is based on an ignorance and that it is also a bondage. And he tells Arjuna that he needs to instead to come to know the real source of works, the real source of action, how action really happens and the high purpose of action. What he's leading up to is the right understanding of our relation to action is that all happens within the one. All is really contained within the one divine reality, proceeds from that and occurs fully within that. So Krishna proceeds to point out that Arjuna is a very fearful man. Even though he's a great hero, a great warrior, he's afraid of many things. He's afraid of sin, suffering, hell, punishment, afraid of God, even afraid of himself. And Arjuna uh, has these fears, even though he's a great hero. And Krishna further explains that the world is ignorant of its true reality. That though these fears haunt all men, they should not haunt Arjuna. People don't know God or the purpose of the world or even the purpose of their own lives, Krishna proceeds to say. And he goes on to explain that his yoga, Krishna's yoga, will bring deliverance and that no step is lost even faltering steps on that path serve to advance our journey. Arjuna understandably struggles with this. It's very difficult for him to accept. And Sri Aurobindo notes much later in the Gita, um, Krishna's wonderful reassurance, which he gives much later, which is something that I think, you know, all of us who are familiar with the Gita or want to become familiar with it, uh, find as a great message, this abandon all laws of conduct and take refuge in me alone. I will deliver you from all sin and evil. Do not grieve. Uh, that's just a wonderful raft to cling to when faced with any challenges. And certainly this is very much what Arjuna needs to hear. Krishna seeks to enlighten Arjuna about the nature of his true self, the true nature of the world and the source of his own action, explaining that because people act ignorantly from wrong intelligence and wrong will, they are bound by their works and suffer the karmic consequences. This wrong intelligence is, cause, is the cause of fear and also the roller coaster of emotions that humanity is prey to. It's the cause of our fleeting joys as well as the cause of our miseries. So if Arjuna and humanity 
of course, as implied, can free themselves from this wrong intelligence, then action can be done in freedom and with serenity and with a sense of peace. This is the yoga of the buddhi, right intelligence, right will. This is based in the one, aware of the one self in all and acting out of this equal serenity. Acting from right intelligence and will, one is never driven by the myriad impulses of the superficial mental self, being attracted this way and that way, unfocused, darting here and there mentally, and probably also in our own actions. Sri Aurobindo explains that there are essentially two types of intelligence. The first is concentrated, poised, homogeneous, characterized by unity. The second is fragmented, desire-driven, with no single will or focus. Buddhi, mental power of understanding, unified intelligence, is in the Gita used in its large philosophic sense of the deciding and discriminating mind. I found in uh, Sri Aurobindo's letters on yoga a uh, quotation which I think will be helpful in understanding what is meant by buddhi in this context. Uh, Sri Aurobindo writes, we use the word understanding as the nearest equivalent we can get in the English language to the Sanskrit philosophical term buddhi. By the understanding, we mean that which one perceives, judges, and discriminates, the true reason of the human being, not subservient to the senses, to desire, or to the blind force of habit, but working in its own right for mastery, for knowledge. So there are two possibilities for the action of the intelligent will, Sri Aurobindo explains to us. And it's pretty clear which is the preferable one. The first possibility is downward into the play of Prakriti and being subject to the gunas. The second, the alternative, is upward and inward toward what Sri Aurobindo describes as the settled peace and equality in the calm and unchanging purity of the soul, conscious, silent, and free from the distractions of nature. In the play of Prakriti, the downward direction, we are at the mercy of the objects of the senses. We are externalized, distracted, our mind darting here and there. We clearly need to choose the direction which takes us upward and inward. This is characterized by settled concentration and perseverance. Sri Aurobindo describes this, this poise as fixing the intelligent will in the calm self-knowledge of the Purusha. The first necessity for doing this is to be rid of desire, to stop our senses from rushing out towards the objects of desire. Our senses are excited by the presence of these and we need to draw them back into their source within us. Sri Aurobindo very charmingly gives an example with the tortoise and, and the tortoise <laughs> and its shell uh, he describes the drawing back of our senses from their attractions to things in the outer world as doing it, we should do this similarly as the tortoise draws back its head and its limbs into its shell. Sri Aurobindo describes the result as being quite wonderful, quiescent in the mind, the mind quiescent in the intelligence, the intelligence quiescent in the soul and its self-knowledge, observing the action of nature, but not subject to it. So this is very different from an external asceticism. It is not only a discipline, though discipline is required. Krishna explains that the source of our liberation is within us, not mind, not intellect, but will. Not will, sorry but the Lord himself, the source of our liberation, our refuge is the Lord himself. And he says, he must sit firm in yoga, wholly given up to me. If we can do this, then we are freed from attachment to the objects of the senses. We can act dispassionately, 
neither liking nor disliking, tranquil, equal in all things. Sri Aurobindo explains that the yoga of the intelligent will leads to the Brahmin status as its culmination. In that state, we are not troubled by desires and longings. We experience great peace in the extinguishment of the ego in the one. An important point in this process is that the will is withdrawn from the usual motive of human actions, the prompting of action by desire. Arjuna is familiar with the renunciation of desire as withdrawal from life and action, the ascetic perspective. Yet Krishna nevertheless exhorts him to act. At first he regards this as contradictory, but Krishna gives him a new paradigm freed from nature, the three gunas, the liberation, the non-attachment is achieved by making all works a sacrifice and offering. Sri Aurobindo acknowledges that we cannot live without action, without work. Simply being and living is an action. We can either act from the ego sense or act for the divine. The spiritual necessity, the path of liberation is to make all life and action a sacrifice, an offering to the divine. This means to do all work with sacrifice as the only object. In the Gita, Krishna says, by doing works otherwise than for sacrifice, this world of men is in bondage to works. For sacrifice, practice works. For sacrifice, practice works. O son of Kunti, becoming free from all attachment. Here, let's reflect on the meaning of the term sacrifice. I found it helpful to consider some of Sri Aurobindo's comments on this in letters to disciples. So I'll read two of these brief quotations. In the spiritual sense, sacrifice does not so much indicate giving up what is held dear as rather an offering of oneself, one's being, one's mind, heart, will, body, life, actions to the divine. It has the original sense of making sacred and it is used as an equivalent word for the word yajna. And Sri Aurobindo being such a wonderful classicist uh, uses sacrifice in you know, considering its root uh, to make sacred. Then the second quote is, sacrifice means an inner joy, an inner offering, excuse me. Sacrifice means an inner offering to the divine and the real spiritual sacrifice is a very joyful thing. So it's not any form of self-immolation of giving up. It's the process of offering, the act of offering to the divine himself. So it is the freedom from the ego sense that enables the individual to sacrifice, to do all works as offerings. In this special sense, sacrifice means offering to the Lord and also sacrifice offering of one's works, actions helps to free one from the ego sense. So essentially they are two interdependent processes that go hand in hand. In the synthesis of yoga, Sri Aurobindo explains that even sacrifice that is not fully sincere is worthwhile and helpful. We can begin where we are and discover that our sincerity and fullness of offering will increase as we engage in this over time. In this higher knowledge, one can act, one can do works in calm and equality, whatever the nature of the action or work. One has to be concentrated in the one, the Lord, the divine, and make life and action a sacrifice and offering to him. If one is living and acting in that consciousness, one does not need to fear the karmic consequences. And most importantly, one is living and acting in a true reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful, beautiful thoughts about uh, the, when you were kind of reading, you know, speaking about these topics, the vision was coming that um, we are all here engaged in this material form. 
and um, we received all the instruments or all the um, strings attached to these levels of material, vital and physical existence from the forces which live on those levels and which we today discussed with Radha exactly this topic, how to disengage from uh, deconstruct the desire and to find the true aspiration within ourselves. It's um, a very good contribution to the same topic that, that being engaged in this world, we meet the forces which are actually substituting for us our own aspirations. They come as a as to our own inner call, as it were. That's why we allow them to come hoping that they will be fulfilling <laughs> our aspirations. <laughs> but they have their own views on things and their own objectives. Uh, and so mixed up with all that, we are kind of losing our path and very dissatisfied with the results of our findings. Uh, even if our desires are realized, we see that, truly speaking, we desired something else. We didn't want to have only that what, we, what came to us as a result of our desire. We were supposed to gain some peace, some happiness, some realization, fulfillment, which is not coming with the realization of the desire. And that shows that we are living kind of on, on two different grounds or in two different simultaneously parallel realities, as it were. One is the inner aspiration for the truth, for the fulfillment, and other is the tools and the means which we received from being embodied in this state from our mental capacities and thoughts, dogmas, uh, philosophies, from our vital capacities of preferences, likings, dislikings, desires, and so on, and from our physical capacity, whatever it may be, or incapacity. And sacrifice is actually to act always from the side of your inner reality, always keeping in mind or in a view, in consciousness, the presence of your inner self while dealing with our uh, means of existence here. And that is the way to liberation. That is not binding. Why the other way is binding, why this action which is not for the sacrifice is binding is because of this that it is coming not from us. Those forces have their own objectives and we fulfill their objectives. That's why it is binding us. <laughs> we just don't know it, we don't see it. We think that we are realizing our desires, but truly speaking, we are realizing their desires. And our aspiration is still there, waiting for its fulfillment. Okay, that was a deconstruction <laughs> on the ground of Karma Yoga. Let us look into the, this beautiful chapter. Om Arjuna Vacha Jaya Si Chet Karmanaste Mata Buddhir Janardana Tatkim Karmani Ghore Mam Nio Jaya Si Keshava Vyami Shrena Vabakiena Buddhim Mohaya Siva Me Tade Kamvadanish Chitya Yena Shre Yohamapnuyam so the question from Arjuna. Jiyaya si chet karmana ste mata buddhir janardana. O janardana, when, if you think that buddhi is better than karma, tat kim karmani ghore mam niyoje si keshava, then why do you assign me to this horrible work and action? He is still bewildered by this. Why should he do this if buddhi is better? 
if some higher, loftier state of consciousness in which you can see things from that philosophical point of view, as it were, beyond senses, why do I have to engage to be engaged with senses and do horrible work? And you bewilder my mind by your mixed speech. You seems to you seem to bewilder my intelligence with a confused and mingled speech. Tell me then decisively that one thing by which I may attain to my soul's will. Tad ekam vada. Tell me one thing. Nishitya, having decided which, yena shreya, by with the help of which, shreyas, the, the good, the ultimate good, aham apnoyam, I shall uh, gain or attain to. Shri Bhagavan Vach, the blissful Lord said, Lokis mean, and now instead of telling him what to do, he says to him about double foundation. Lokis mean dvividhani shtha pura prokta maya nagha, jnana yogena sankhyanam, karma yogena yoginam. In this world, twofold is the self application of the soul by which it enters into Brahmic consciousness. As I before said, a sinless one, that of the Sankhyas by the yoga of knowledge and that of the yogins by the yoga of works. What, what, which yog- word there means soul, uh, Vladimir? Which Sanskrit word is translated as soul? Well, there is... Yes, the self-application of the soul, dvividha nishtha. Nishtha is the foundation, literally. Why he says the soul is kind of difficult to... Nishtha is the uh, establishment within. Maybe that's why the soul. Some foundation within. Ni means inwardly, shtha, foundation, staying within. So loke asmin dvividha, double foundation, pura prokta mayanagha, or, or sinless one by me was declared the sinless, double sinless foundation. What is this double? What do you think? Well, he says here, jnana yogana sankhyanam, for the people of sankhya, of the temperament of philosophy, it is jnana yoga. He will speak about jnana yoga more. Yeah? It is yoga by knowledge or svadhyaya. And we will have to look into svadhyaya and understand how the yoga of knowledge is uh, performed. And karma yoga na yoginam. And for the yogins, it is karma yoga. So for Krishna, yoga is karma yoga and not philosophy. It has to be done, it has to be experienced, it has to be practiced. It is not that what you think or realize in the mind, it's not enough. But both lead to this fulfillment of Brahmic consciousness. And he will speak about this, that there is no purer way than um, uh, Jnana Yoga, than knowledge. He will reconcile between knowledge and action very soon. He will say that all the action here in this world done for the sake of knowledge only. We are doing it to get to know ourselves better. There is no other way to do here anything. There is no meaning in doing anything here, only to realize oneself better and better, to become aware of one, oneself. Nakarmanam anaramban naishkarmyam purushoshnute, nachasan yasana deva siddhim samadhigachati. Not by abstentation 
abstention, sorry, not by abstention from works, does a man enjoy actionlessness. Nor by mere renunciation of works, does he attain to his perfection, to see the, the accomplishment of the aims of his self-discipline by yoga. Nakarmanam anarambhan naishkarmyam purushoshnuti. Purusha does not arrive at actionlessness by not beginning or not starting the works. By not beginning anything to do, he will not arrive at actionlessness. So by doing nothing, he will not arrive at doing nothing. You have to do something to arrive at it. <laughs> you have to do a lot in order to arrive at this actionlessness. And at the same time, Nacha Sanya Sanadeva Siddhim Samadhi Gachati. And you cannot arrive at success or at the um, accomplishment or realization without sannyasa, without um, uh, renunciation. This is a bewildering for the mind. Yeah, <laughs> mind is so used to these oppositions that <laughs> that kind of getting lost immediately. So, but practically speaking, this is the solution. So, without sannyasa, the realization of action is impossible. Without not doing action, to arrive at actionlessness is impossible. The same way. So one has to do something and one has to do it with renunciation of desires. From the desires we have to remove ourselves, our motivation of action. And that's why we have to, uh, to renounce the fruit of actions. Yeah? Fruit is the, the binding uh, knot of us to the desire and to the forces which are acting through us, not to our own inner aspirations, but to the forces which are outside and have their own objectives and fulfilling those objectives through us. Nahi kaschit kshanam api jato tishthatya karma krit karyate yavashach karma sarvach prakriti jayar gonaich. Because no one, even for a moment, can stay a karmakrit without doing the action. Karya te yavashach karma. And karma is done hopelessly or helplessly. Sarvach prakriti jayar gonaich. By the modes born of prakriti. Would the modes be the gunas? Right. Yeah. The modes, gunas. Gunas are doing this whether we want it or not. Whether we have something else in mind, gunas will be doing. Gunas rotate in gunas, as he will say later. And uh, whether we think that we are doing it or not, the gunas are doing the real work. So if we disengage our consciousness from this, and we will look at the gunas rotating in gunas, we will be able to find our unborn true self, which is actually a true witness to what the Prakriti is doing. But we are so engaged and so identified with the result and fruit and motivation and desire. Desire is that which is binding us to that motivation. No? As if we are the doer, that we don't even see it. So we land ourselves to, into the hands of Prakriti and she does whatever she wants with us. There is a beautiful canto in, in uh, Savitri, the secret knowledge, yes. And there he speaks about this, how Purusha gives himself willingly to Prakriti. <laughs> and she does with him whatever she wants. 
and he fulfills all her caprices and all her whims. You know? She can do with him whatever she likes. So, so Vladimir, the reason I was asking before about which word uh, meant the soul is, as you just indicated, um, because we are talking Sankhya, uh, we tend to talk Purusha being the unborn one. And yet this translation uh, being soul gives you and going inwards gives you more the indication of the born one of the, of the psychic being. So um, does, does Krishna speak anywhere of, well, he does because he's within uh, each of us, but, but why is this word being translated as soul uh, instead of uh, Atman or the unborn one? Because soul it, gives that, in, that sense of being inner. I think you're right. It is this inborn self. That is means for us who are here in the body, who are born, born here for our souls, yes? In this world is the self-application of the soul. Now, of this inborn self. So there are two applications. One is unborn self above the head. Another is inborn self within the heart. And you can actually nearly see this but jnana yoga is that philosopher from above yeah and karma yoga is this who is doing here constant sacrifice the soul the psychic being which is bringing the light into all the um, modalities of our action and thought and feeling you could nearly see that division yeah uh, since you are pushing in that direction which is not here in the text uh, if we are to widen the scope, we would see that these are the two centers. And this is the dual approach. One is unborn self, viewing everything, yeah? kind of uh, independently from nature, doing things, what we have to recover. And the other is karma yogin within, adhiyajna, within the heart, yeah? who will be doing the sacrifice, the work the works as the sacrifice that one doesn't do sacrifice right this one does so it this duality here is already intuitively laid out for us in this first what he said for the soul most probably that's how shirobindo uses this word here yeah because he speaks about this duality. That's why we have Sri Aurobindo and the mother, both of them. That is the duality. He says this, that he is the presence over the head, which acts from the spiritual kind of perception over our mind and vital. And the mother is the presence in the heart. as a psychic, which acts upon the vital and physical consciousness. And here these two come together. This is, and by both you can achieve the Brahmic consciousness. So we are enlarging the scope since you asked about soul again. But I, I can intuitively feel it because it is all within the same scope of what we are dealing with in um, integral yoga. No? Yeah, it always just seems strange because uh, neither Sankhya or uh, Raj Yoga speaks of the soul. There, there is, you know, a, a God uh, in Raj Yoga, and there's Purusha in uh, in Sankhya. So, so yeah, it just didn't. I, I didn't didn't understand what they truly meant by this. Uh, is this this Sri Aurobindo's translation? It seems, I'm not totally sure because it is taken from uh, the essays on the Gita and if it is not there, then it is added by, um, by the editor. Okay. Uh, it would be also nice maybe one day to just uh, define for sure where is Sri Aurobindo's and where is not, yeah? But um, nobody did this work, so we could do that also on the way. But even then, if it is not so, you see, soul is from from the not capital letter, so it means um, something like 
both ways. Twofold is the self-application of the embodied being, let us say. So one is the psychic, other is the unborn self. And this is this dual. We know it from Sri Aurobindo's yoga. Yeah. And there is no triple application or some single application. There's dual. <laughs> All right, great. So everyone is forced to do helplessly the work by the gunas born from Prakriti. And no moment, no one moment or second, man can stay without the action. We are acting constantly upon ourselves and the world. And there is no way that you can be out of it in this embodied state. So if you want to arrive at this uh, uh, actionlessness or the state in which you do not act anymore, you will have to do something. And that's what Karma Yoga is about. He will tell us what we are to do in order to arrive at that state, to be aware of our uh, state in which we do not act. Karmendriani, Karmendriani, San Yamyaya Aste Manasasmaran, Indriarthan Vimurhatma, Mityacharach Sauchyate. I was doing, we were doing this already, no? It feels like we read it, or maybe it was in another presentation. And the one who controls the organs of action, that means I will not move now. I will not speak, no, I will not do this, I will not do that, but continues in his mind to remember and dwell upon the objects of sense, enjoying them subtly, as it were, imagining things. Such a man has bewildered himself with false notions of self-discipline. You can enjoy the whole world in the mind. <laughs> you can enjoy ice creams and being rich and being loved and being this and being that and go on and go on, feed your senses till you are losing your fainting from, you know, from this uh, delight of existence. Uh, this is something very important because um, in our yoga, what we do, we usually reject the actions of karmendriyas and we fall into the lap of jnanendriyas where they recreate all the activities for themselves in the mind. So you can sit in the cave in the Himalayas, look at the wall. That's why most probably <laughs> Bodhisattva was sitting for nine years in front of the wall, <laughs> trying to get rid of those impressions in the mind, <clears throat> because there was nothing else to see but the wall. But it took him nine years to really clean up the consciousness. Huh? Uh, because otherwise you can go into imagination or into the enjoyment of subtle indriyas huh? in the subtle worlds. By the way, there is a very beautiful book, uh, Rosenkreuzer, it's called, uh, written by Vsevolod Solovyov, one of the occultists in Russia. And there, this uh, occultist, he built for himself the worlds in which subtle worlds in the, in the occult plane, in the vital plane, where he could disappear as a king. He, has, he had his kingdom there. He had his servants, his wife, queen. He had his feasts of food, music, everything. Palace of enjoyments. And he was going there often to enjoy himself <laughs> into that subtle world. And then he came to the queen and the queen was the uh, Yekaterina II, who was actually, mother claims that she was the Vibhuti of Yekaterina II. And uh, she told him, you see, you are living in this world and they are not real. I am living in the real world and I am ruling the real country. <laughs> you build up 
And then what interesting was in that book, he went into those worlds and he noticed that his servants whom he created in his mind, his wife was already betraying him with some general <laughs> queen. He noticed that they have their own will separate from him. And he was so disappointed. And he saw that the, uh, the queen was right. Ekaterina II was right that it wasn't true power over nature. It was his own wish, his own power, occult power, which could create for him the worlds. It wasn't true, it wasn't real. And then he changed. So it's a, an interesting um, book about this, that in this subtle world, you can enjoy the world totally, create your worlds, but it is a false notion of self-discipline. Yastvindriyani manasani yam yara bhater juna karmendriye karma yogam asaktah savishishyate. But he who controlling the senses by the mind without attachment engages with the organs of action in yoga of action, he excels. The one who withdrew the senses from the object of sense, as uh, Marta was mentioning today, as the tortoise withdrawing the limbs under the shell, he is in possession of himself. And now, being in possession of his own self, he can engage in any activity without expecting any result, without attaching him to the desires, to the fruit of action. He can introduce that sense of the spirit, of his spiritual freedom into the action. Niyatam kuru karmatvam, karma jyayo ya karmanach, sharira ya trapi chate, naprasidhiet ar akarmanach. Do thou do controlled action. Do the controlled action. Do the activities. Niyatam controlled. Tvam karma jyayo yakarmanach, because action is greater than inaction. Even the maintenance of thy physical life cannot he, he effected without action. Cannot, cannot be, I think it's be, cannot be effected without action. We have to brush our teeth in the morning and we have to wake up. We have to make breakfast. We have to take shower. We have to do these activities, whether we want it or not. <laughs> we cannot stop living. Hey, Vladimir, may I yes. ask you something? Please go ahead. I would love to hear your how, how you, oh, talk about Carmendrias and Genendrias. Yeah. The, the idea is, as we already looked into before, that the Jnanendriyas are finding different, different source for themselves. Yes? They are kind of becoming, turning towards their spiritual origin, as it were. They are not tight or bound with the object of sense anymore. They are not looking for satisfaction of themselves from the object of sense. That's where they got caught by other powers, by the powers of the mind and the vital. Once they were looking for the object of sense and wanting to get the delight out of them, these powers creeped in and started to act on their behalf, blocking and clogging their uh, clarity. And even if they realize those objectives, those desires, they see that they didn't realize their own uh, aspiration for fulfillment. Fulfillment is not taking place by realizing the desires. Because truly speaking, they were hijacked. That aspiration of the uh, Gnanendrias was hijacked by the other forces through this application and free, through this attachment to the object of sense. 
So the genendrias were hijacked by the carmendrias? They were hijacked by the forces, yes, which are coming from the depth of that inconscient from which Carmendrias are growing. Carmendrias grew up from the, our evolutionary past. They were built in this evolutionary march from the beginning of time when we got first time embodied as consciousness came down. Yeah. And then this, these organs of action were evolving and developing. And they do not know how to sacrifice. They do not know how to do the action with the light within because they don't have it. So what they do when they are activated, uh, activated in a way that Jnanendri is supporting them, then they bring all those forces through those activities to Jnanendri's and they, the, our senses, so to say, which represent Purusha, become clogged or become bewildered, become lost. They start fulfilling the desires of other forces as if they are own and cannot be ever fulfilled by that. But the other forces aren't Carmendrias or Genendrias. It's Carmendrias are the uh, legs, hands, speech, procreatory, and excretory organs. These are yes. Carmendrias. Yes. Behind them, there are forces. Forces which come from the general uh, nature, from the subconscious nature, from the vital nature. There are many of them. And they all want to have a fulfillment within this adhar, within this mm -hmm. uh, vessel. If, if they hijack this vessel, they have the access to the enjoyment. Yeah? Through this vessel, they have many more things. They can endure and uh, continue to be in time. Yeah? If they hijack it, if they really can possess. That's why this, this fight is going for this adhar, for this vessel. The forces of darkness and forces of light clash here because every one of them wants to possess this particular body because within this body, within the heart, there is the divine spark. And that is the key to everything. They want that spark to work for them. That generates Soma, the delight of existence, which they want and crave for. They want Yajamana to work for them, for their egoistic ends. They don't want Yajamana in the heart to work for the divine, for non-egoistic ends, because that means the end of their rule, the end of their life. They will have to, to be transformed, changed, which is quite difficult for them. They are not willing easily to change. And uh, that is what today, uh, by the way, Martha was mentioning this um, topic that a sacrifice is a bliss, you know, and, and happiness and not um, suffering. But for these forces, sacrifice is suffering because they will have to change. So we can look at this sac sacrifice as a double process, yes? For the soul and in its expansion in, this, uh, in the means of its own, it is the joy, definitely. If you look from the soul's perspective, it's a joy, joyful act. It's a sunlit path, sacrifice. <laughs> but for the, for the unconscious forces in us, those who resist do not want to change, want to possess our vessel. For them, it is a painful process of transformation and they are not willing to give themselves. They're willing to fight and they, they are suffering from it. Suffering to the extent of their kind of limited uh, being, yeah? that, that narrow being has to be widened. And when we widen the narrow being, it's quite painful for them, as it were. But once it is widened, they are very happy. Once it is transformed, they have no problem with it. They welcome the change. But in the process, they resist. 
so are the gyanendriyas the subtle senses of the mind like besides the like the normal organs of legs hand speech like the gyanendriyas are the subtle senses or something like what exactly are they what is our yes what is uh, seeing hearing what are these yeah these are karmendriyas, right? The sense These are jnanendriyas. Jnanendriyas is seeing, hearing, and touch, also smell and taste. These are jnanendriyas. Yes. They are the projections of the Purusha. They are representing the universal Purusha. Uh, you remember in Aitareya, they all came from the universal Purusha and plunged into the darkness of inconscient, from which they built evolutionary these individual purushas or individual beings so look at our body our body is an embodiment of these faculties our body exists only for the sake of these faculties to function to see to hear to speak to touch to move to understand yeah to feel love that's what it is the body is the embodiment of these universal faculties of Purusha. Now, can they bring universal Purusha into the action here, to the surface, or they would be hijacked by other powers from the realms to which they entered, and by the means of those unconscious forces? And that is the battle. And we can feel it within ourselves. We have in us the part which is unconscious. It is our body. We are not very aware of our body. We are not aware on the surface of what we are. We are not aware of other beings outside ourselves even. Even within ourselves, within our body, we are not aware how it functions. We are not aware how we are thinking, how we are feeling. It all comes to us somehow. And we do not know where it comes from. Our un we are so unaware. And deeper when we go into the heart, we find somebody who is totally aware of himself. And so there are gradations from absolute awareness of ourselves to less, 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 and total unawareness on the surface. So we have the full gradation of possible levels of awareness so we are of double nature i was struck if i can jump in yeah please well we almost when martha was talked about um how fear dominates arjuna you know and I, maybe that's i think that's what you're talking about i mean i'm either living in fear or I'm free of it, maybe. I mean, I'm very aware that I have, I can look back on the last 10 years of my life and I have made major life decisions based on fear. And a little bit of faith too, but I keep seeing this Abhaya Mudra, right? All these gurus have this going on, right? All, the, all my little deity statues have this, you know, fearless. And I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm terrified of everything, if I'm really honest. I mean, I'm, I'm afraid of fear. So, <laughs> and, you know, so here I am. I mean, it, it, I, I have to act. I can't stop seeing. I can't stop smelling. I can't stop hearing. You know, I could tell you I'm going to sit here and engage enlightenment, but I'm going to get up and go to the refrigerator and I'm going to eat. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> that's better. Um, yeah. um, I, so here it says, you know, it, so I'm going to control the senses by the mind. Well, it's an age old question. I'm so sorry. I mean, does right action lead to right thinking or does right thinking lead to right action? We need both, both right action and right to be, thinking. Yeah. There has to be some discipline and I have to cultivate the sattvic because Rajatama will just become like a tornado. You know, so. And if tornado comes, you have to take it as it is in its own time and space right. yes, and <laughs> yeah. see where it belongs and why it is there. 
so to say engage with it from the buddhist point of view as it were understand what understanding is a good word for buddhi understand why it is there what it is that here to do and let it do it don't be so much kind of trying to to do something else on the top for some mm. other reason see what it does why it is there right but about fear what you said i am afraid of fear is amazing because in sanskrit actually it is used in double ablative sense so from fear from someone i am afraid so i'm shrinking from the fear of from someone so i'm afraid from it's interesting why from you know? because fear is actually shrinking you shrink back to yourself you cannot expand you cannot include your periphery into yourself you see that periphery is not you this is not you that is not you wherever it is not you you do not know what to do with it and so you shrink you are afraid we are constantly afraid because we see everywhere uh, not self not ourselves we see something else it's not me this is not me that is not me i'm not there i'm not here i'm nowhere so this is a constant fear no i i'm kind of shrinking back to myself this is me this is here where i am this is okay that everything else is wrong everything else is in question mark whether i will be there at home or not that's why i have to manipulate to try to to be liked to like people i start you know projecting myself as a good person Be why because i want to get rid of that fear i have i want to find myself in them and them in myself i want to relax for for some time that's why this idea of the house house griham is that which is holding everything where you can relax actually be yourself it's your home you don't need to shrink every time from everything <laughs> to yourself because that is your extension in which you can be at home so going to the fridge and reaching out to something <clears throat> it's actually you <laughs> you know it it's okay <laughs> there is no need to shrink there's some kind of self assertion self establishment in the wider context it's a killer of fear food you can eat a lot and feel a little heavy and then you feel okay i am fine again <laughs> i'm not alone food is within me <laughs> right yeah it's a profound question about fear yes well, and it does seem like this is hitting on it when you know, he's really telling me that i'm i'm not even really ultimately in control of my actions i mean i am I, but i'm not it's uh and that's so it's, so surrender seems to be interwoven through all of this on some level it's a journey i guess of discovery so I, that's, uh, yeah. I it's very rare that we we act without any fear that means but really any fear it is very rare that it is happening but when it is happening we we don't even notice that we do anything because that is the right action As Sri Aurobindo says, when you sit on the top of the Himalayas and you act upon the world and you feel that you don't do anything, that is the right action. Because you are not different from the world. You are the world. You extended yourself. There is nothing to shrink from anymore. Great. Okay, let us stop today here at seven o'clock and uh, reassemble next time. For the next time, uh, we can continue with this and um, um, with the chapter three and look into those. Please read the chapters 10 and 11. You will find a lot of interesting thoughts of this kind of which Martha was presenting today. And there are many subtleties there, which also are very conducive to our new perceptions, which uh, is more difficult to convey 
you have to experience them and then maybe in some way you could share some glimpses. I wanted to thank you too, Martha. That was absolutely wonderful to, to get your perspective and your input and, and summary. So thank you so much for the effort and thoughts. Thank yes, you. thank you. Thank you, Martha. That was beautiful. Thank you. I value you. your feedback. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Great. So I'm closing with the mantra. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchit Dukha Bhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Shri Gurubhya Namaha Hari Om Adios. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Namaste. Bye.